Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of the Qarween podcast. This is your host, Sara, and today I am joined by my two usual hosts. I'm here with Aisha H and Amina, but also we have a few new staff members in, on the Qarween project who have joined us for today's episode. So I wanted to also introduce Fadila and Norhan. How are all you ladies doing? Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. How's everybody doing? Assalamualaikum. Alhamdulillah. Very well. Alhamdulillah. Good to have you all here. Alhamdulillah. It's it's so exciting having so many people like <laughs> on the podcast today. Like I think this is probably the biggest number like we've ever had, right? So it's just as a new format. It's exciting. Aside from yeah, the amazing, is. mashallah, like people who are yeah. with us. Feels very worldwide. Where's everyone from today? <laughs> London. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, if you guys want to give like a two second, like just where you're from, what you do at TQP. That just uh, so also so people can identify voices <laughs> as they're listening to the podcast but yeah Fadila do you want to start sure yeah uh, my name's Fadila as you know I'm based in Dublin and I'm a writer uh, I feel like people are rejoicing at the Irish accent just hearing that <laughs> I wish I had a stronger one but I, I think I sound kind of deceptive saying I'm from Ireland but then yeah. like giving American <laughs> benefit it's all right I'm sorry I didn't say salam earlier, I was stuffing my face with breakfast, um, but um, I'm Norhan and I'm from San Diego and I am a writer for TQP. These, we've had these sisters on the team for almost a year now, um, who initially started out as interns, but then we liked them so much we decided to keep them as staff because... Yeah, they've been like a great, um, just they've just given great contributions to the team, alhamdulillah. They said that they're writers, but they, they've contributed wonderful ideas and like helped with the strategy of the organization and helped us grow like as an entire team, alhamdulillah. Um, but yeah, today's discussion is, it's about the concept of da'wah, broadly speaking. Um, and it literally, da'wah means to call people to something, to invite people to something. And in this context, we're talking about inviting people to Islam. And that, you know, it can refer to both calling non-Muslims to accept Islam and to learn about Islam, but it also can refer to just teaching Muslims about their own deen um, and to improve the practice of the deen. I think we're going to be focusing a lot more on the former aspect of it um, because this was inspired by a conversation that we had amongst ourselves. We were talking about da'wah culture in our different locales um, and, you know, really organized formal da'wah efforts, whether that's even a thing in the, you know, in our locales and everything. So we're going to talk about that, inshallah. Um, but yeah, I want to like first start by just laying the groundwork and giving people an idea of the different contexts that we do come from. So what do Dawa efforts look like in your locale? Have you ever engaged in any yourself? Um, can you describe to us basically, yeah, what's Dawa culture and stuff where you're from? I'll say in Ireland, because we are neighbors with the UK, I suppose we did definitely take a lot uh, copy and paste style from the UK but in a good way I mean we definitely looked at uh, what we admired and the Muslim population in the UK is significantly older than the Irish population of Muslims so we definitely had a lot to learn in that regard so we learned a lot from like you know big institutions and also you know smaller mosques and even family members and uh, less major links I suppose. Um, I would say in Ireland uh, there is a really heartening scene uh, in in Dawa with young people uh, taking a lead uh, with their own initiatives, especially in university ISOCs, which is which are Islamic societies. Um, there is a lot of effort, you know, to engage with the wider non-Muslim college community, lots of, you know, mosque open days as well, and just generally um, a very open arm approach. And there is, I suppose, what I would class as hard and soft Dawa. So there is very much like, you know, Muslims people having Muslim colleagues and Muslim friends and learning about Islam in a very casual way. And then there is also the more, what I would term as hard da'wah, where we, you know, intentionally go out and like set up stands and, uh, you know, have a very targeted approach to delivering the message of Islam. Yeah, the that was still phenomenon was really widespread in the UK like 10 years ago. And it was a very overt form of that were asking people what they know about Islam, calling them to study Islam and not letting them leave the stall until they have the resources to study Islam. Uh, it was a very persistent effort. And, you know, I know people who took like detours to avoid these stalls. Uh, but, you know, male like accepted it. It was very, <laughs> very hardcore. I <laughs> uh, think that roadside that word has become a lot less common over the years uh, for various reasons, mainly on being security. Uh, I still find it very refreshing, though, how, you know, you walk through, like, the hustle and bustle of Leicester Square, uh, a lot of music, a lot of noise, and then there's the faint sound of Qur'an just, you know, cutting through the noise as you approach the one central that was all there. 
and you know I think one of the main organizations involved um is Ayera um in both in giving that award and in training people to give that award to and you know it ranges from roadside stalls to you know university workshops and I think ISOC is one of the main spots for that award efforts today um it personally changed my life and was very helpful in a time where you know you have been given so much freedom and that to in, in an environment that is you know not only secularized but full of so much depravity as well um, I think from regular classes on the core tenets of faith and their very active Dawah initiative that discovered Islam Week, um, you know, the amount of care um, such a small institution can carry out with so little in terms of resources and funding and so much against it, I think is amazing. Um, and obviously there will, there will be people with bad experiences and, you know, not to present it as something so perfect, but I would say it's one of the less recognised front runners in the Dawah scene at the current time. In the 90s and early um, 2000s, it was a whole different story from, like, according to the tales my family tell me, um, the Dawah scene on campus was very different. A lot of, you know, a Salafi influence, the HT influence, um, but, you know, like all other things, um, you know, the same fate it suffered the same fate as all else that is Islamic in the public sphere. And ISOC's now are extremely limited in the ways in which they can operate, um, who they can platform and it's just gearing more towards presenting Muslims in a positive light and taking the soft that war approach, I guess. Yeah, I mean you say that, I mean, about the Dawa stalls. I remember being on the Dawa stall, you know, about a decade ago. Um <laughs> I was a bit young at the time, but it was a really nice experience, as you said, to just be able to actually meet people, um, you know, and speak to them directly about their concerns. It's a form of hard dawa, like I, I like um, the dealer's distinction there between kind of hard dawa and soft dawa. Um, but it was very authentic as well. And I think that this was as well an, before the era of where like places like Speaker's Corner, for example, have the reputation that they have now, where it's very much about debates and argumentation. This was kind of supposed to be a very authentic way of reaching out to people in your local community and even just combating misconceptions about Islam. Obviously, the element of tackling the theology was there, but it was a time where there still was a lot of misconceptions. You know, it's the kind of post 9-11 era and things like that. So Alhamdulillah, I always have fond memories uh, of Dawah stalls, as as you said. Yeah. And I feel like, to be honest, the you know, when there is somebody in front of you and you see that person as a person um, and they see you as a person, there is so much good that can be done aside from just the actual argument. And I am a bit sceptical now of how, I mean, I know inshallah we're going to talk a little bit more about this in the rest of the session, but what I would see is kind of the digitalization of, of, of the Dawa scene, where so much of this is about having kind of now videos about particular topics and then reaction videos and people arguing with prominent, um, you know, atheist or humanist or people of, you know, different persuasions and having this kind of back and forth was just like a huge audience of spectators. And that's not to say that debates are wrong and debates did happen. And that's another thing that I think very much in the UK, again, about a decade ago, I remember attending a lot of debates at universities, um, as you were saying, Amina, where they brought different speakers of different persuasions together but that was more in good faith I think and because it was in an institutional setting a lot more controlled and a lot more um just dignified (laughs) I guess to be quite honest and it's unfortunate the way now kind of there's a lot of good that's coming out of um the Dao scene today in terms of arguments but sometimes the way it's expressed it, it really does make people pause but I think that you know aside from all of that um I think, alhamdulillah, the fact that, mashallah, these organizations, some of which we've mentioned, you know, have grown and the individuals who are part of them have grown in in their expertise as well, mashallah, has really, I mean, for me, the contrast was very apparent um, recently when I was uh, in Turkey and I was volunteering at uh, one of the masajid there where they were doing da'wah to tourists. And mashallah, these, this was an amazing organization, amazing people, but it was a very interesting lesson in the different ways in which da'wah is conducted in the West versus in the Muslim world. Um, and perhaps we'll talk a little bit more about that kind of later on. I don't want to just keep going right now. But, uh, you know, there's this. it really just, I guess, cemented for me how lucky we are in the West to have this opportunity of getting reward because it's not something that people in the Muslim world necessarily automatically do have access to or do and and and, you know as much as we're saying that it's difficult and there are all these problems the clarity of arguments that we have had from these decades of engagement and interaction in these spheres uh you know have mashallah brought a lot of benefit as well 
much less quite inspiring to hear Aisha so involved in that way if it's at such a young age because you know I've never ever ever seen it as my job to ever be involved in such things because you know I've ever always thought you know there are much better people to do these things um but you know funny enough for the longest time my family were the only practicing Muslims on our road and it you know, it was a whole okay let's give them food and then slip them in some dawah and hopefully plant the seed of Islam and you know we were pretty much winning in that domain uh but recently our new neighbors that have moved in our christian missionaries from india and on their first day here they sent over food and um you know i didn't catch on at first but when she was speaking to me she slightly slipped in this like anecdote about jesus and i was like oh my god she's good you know that was, that was the first time i really had to consider that you know other ways of giving that were because now we have competition <laughs> and their food is delicious for a lot you know like i either have to learn to cook or like make a trip down to speaker's corner Swallow. but you know now i realize that you know um that were efforts are not just um for a specific view and i know we have to some people are better at giving that were in different ways uh, but the soft that we approach in terms of presenting ourselves well to the community is something that we should always and um, all be engaging in. Uh, but there will be times in that, you know, we do need to kind of look into how to give very direct um, that word to Subhanallah. OK, so this is the UK slash Ireland perspective. Americans, tell us <laughs> what is it like on your side of the pond? Okay, so I think like the Dawa scene in America is quite different from the UK actually. I feel like we don't really have much of like the street Dawa, the Dawa stalls. I feel like people here are often, at least the Muslims here, I feel like they're often more reluctant to talk about their religion like publicly, like more about the practice and the, um, you know, the theological aspect of the religion. So most of like the Dawa happens, um, through like interfaith efforts so like the imams of the masajid they'll often um do events with um christian or jewish priests and um talk about islam that way um in the muslim student associations the which are the american equivalents of isocs um they have like islam awareness week um and they have like dawa stalls um during Islam Awareness Week at public places in the university campuses. Um, When I was in like, since I went to an Islamic school for elementary and middle school, we did have like um, other like private schools, Christian, uh, different um, uh, Christian sect schools from like students from like they have different schools. And so students often from those schools would come uh, to our school and then we would have a chance to talk to them about Islam and hijab and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I would say besides that, like there's no like like public, like not a big like public that was seen of like just setting up stalls in public and talking to passerbys about Islam. Yeah. Yeah. For context, me and Norhan are both from California. So there's, I think there's a pretty consistent culture like across the state when it comes to this stuff i would say like yeah i definitely can't speak for the like the rest of the country i would say probably things are different in places like new york um where you might have like at least somewhat more of like a street dawa style but even then i don't think it's as present as places like the uk um but yeah i had like pretty much similar experience growing up where i think in i don't even know if they still do this honestly but when i was a kid our local masjid would just have like um, iftars where they like during Ramadan, they would invite non-Muslims, um, you know, they would eat iftar, they would like, you know, be able to observe the salah and stuff. And I would always invite my school teachers to that, uh, which like thinking back, like I feel like kids wouldn't do that now. Like, you know, kind of like talking to your teachers about religion or even talking to your peers about religion. But at the time I would like, yeah, I would take like like my gifts to my teachers would be like take them nice things but I would always if it was a woman I would take her like a, a scarf as like a hijab and I remember it you know like not all, not all of the teachers would come to those things but I remember when my fifth grade teacher came and she was wearing the like hijab that I got her and she was like it was very nice like she was very like open to it. she was just a very nice person in general but like it was yeah it felt like kind of off it, it didn't feel you know it didn't make me feel the way I feel about a lot of Dawah efforts now where it just feels like, okay, the only goal here is to improve, you know, the image of Muslims without necessarily presenting the content of Islam. Um, I feel like that was, yeah, it was very authentic. Um, but then l- later on, I, f- I don't know, I, it's also not my my forte or it, it's not my sphere of involvement necessarily in the community to be involved in like outward facing Dawah efforts. But in college, when I was in MSA, 
we did have like what we call it tabling which is like there's always an msa table out like you know where the clubs have their tables but and it was called like you know we had a dawa committee and stuff but it, we didn't really engage in dawa like the the table was where other muslims just hung out between classes um if any non-muslims ever did come up to the table it was rare if they did i feel like nobody there would have been prepared to answer their questions anyway so maybe it was like for the best that like we didn't really have a super active out like outward facing dawah effort but other than that we had yeah like islamic awareness week which was decent you know like we had um events where i feel like i remember we had like a pretty good event where um we had a speaker talk about like jesus and mary and islam um and it was like you know like an honest presentation and like i feel like that's a good topic because it you know um yeah it's it's an honest presentation of like the content of islam in a way that other people can like at least partially relate to it if they're coming from a christian background or if they're just aware of like you know christian like religious rhetoric and history um but otherwise yeah it's definitely i would say um i don't know if it's it, which is interesting because i from what i know from speaking to you guys from the uk that like culture there is a lot more secular and it's a lot less you know favorable to just talk about religion publicly and stuff versus here like you'll encounter more you know like ostensibly practicing christians but it's very awkward to you know to like just to start talking about religion let alone like set up a formal avenue through which to like quote unquote proselytize so yeah and i think that that's not if you were to like talk to you know your like msa or your message or whatever and to say like oh this is something that we need to invest more like time and like volunteers and money into they'd be like no we have like bigger issues we need to focus on like the internal state of the community our own community members don't even know about like islamic practice and stuff so it's like i understand also maybe that maybe it's not a priority for a lot of communities but yeah so that was actually kind of going to be my next question to you sara because especially as well going back to the point where you said that you feel perhaps people are trying to think about how islam appears to other people and like perceptions of islam as opposed to kind of wanting to actually get people to accept islam and and convert themselves do you feel like dawa is a dawa to non muslims is a priority um for your community and that's not necessarily a bad thing if it isn't but obviously your community and then you know you're saying of course that it's different in different parts of the country but your kind of more broader perspective i guess both of you you and norhan yeah I would say here I don't I think maybe for individual people like I know people who are like known to be involved in like interfaith efforts but it's like a very small like it's like a select few people that you know like if anybody does have an interfaith event there's like one guy that they'll all invite like <laughs> because he's good at speaking about those things and like you know I've I've known people who've done like interfaith book clubs and stuff like that but it's very localized I don't think it's like a a broader commitment if there is anything like that I'm not aware of it and to an extent i get it because there is just like a lot of like there there's like internal coalition building that has to happen within the muslim community where you just have like different segments of the community that don't interact with each other or segments of the community that are, that are like masjid who are inviting cops and like you know having events with the police and stuff like that like there there's a lot of internal issues that need to be fixed but i don't think that that means that you know we can't like target both simultaneously but yeah I suppose it's like relevant to mention that it is kind of a responsibility for everyone whether or not it's a priority and then like citing the verse of the Quran uh, that we're meant to be witnesses unto mankind like you know and that is like whether we do it soft or hard or overtly or not I mean it's always something that we're conscious of because we represent Islam in like everything we do or at least we try to yeah no that's actually really important because and this is something that like it just it never comes up in discussion because it's taken for granted but maybe you guys have heard discussions about like especially if you have family in muslim countries or you've lived in a muslim country you've heard discussions about like whether it's even permissible for muslims to live in non-muslim countries like majority non-muslim countries and like this is like a legitimate fiqh discussion and as far as i know like my there's a the one paper i know in english that like discusses it pretty in depth is by dr sherman jackson it's called like the socio political something of muslims in in the united states or in the west or something but he literally just he goes through like kind of classical fiqh opinions about whether muslims can live in like non muslim communities um and kind of like the end verdict if i can call it that is that those who consider it permissible only consider it permissible under the condition that those muslims are actively inviting mm. people to islam so it's not you know it's not enough to just like 
like up and move somewhere because it's like more comfortable or whatever but like i feel like if we were to you know if that is if we were to start like teaching people that it would kind of come as a shock to a lot of people that you know it's not that like living in a muslim country versus living amongst non-muslims it's not the same and like your attitude can't be exactly the same where you know in a in a muslim country like yeah you still have responsibilities towards the broader community but um it's almost easier to just kind of like be lax and like take dean for granted and just kind of assume that like your kids will grow up around muslims and they'll have a masjid to go to and they'll have islamic classes to go yeah. to and stuff like that so no absolutely i always think about that paper sada because you were the one who introduced me to it when having these kinds of conversations not even just about dawa but just more broadly kind of muslim minorities in the west and i think it's um it's very interesting because that's absolutely something that's not spoken about enough and i don't even think it's as i don't think it's conceived as even the kind of foundation of muslim da'wah efforts here um not to say that obviously people don't think as uh, fadila mentioned that there is great reward in this and that it is an instruction from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but that actually this is something that is fard kifaya you know it's a communal obligation on our communities in the west i've never really heard it kind of stated in that way and i feel like we would definitely give more priority to it if we did think about it in 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 that sense and i mean i'm interested to get kind of um amina and fadila's opinion on this as well because it could just kind of be my own perception <laughs> you know with my own biases about the, the 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 situation that we have today but i feel like there was a period of time where people were giving these kinds of dawa efforts a lot more attention and that compared to then i feel like it has decreased in priority and i think that our communities are very much focused on having things like good representation and again putting out a better image of islam in order to yeah destroy misconceptions and tackle islamophobia and things like that which are good aims in and of themselves but that's not really about explaining islam to non-muslims right it's about explaining muslims to non-muslims and trying to show them that you know either what well, we're just like you you know you don't need to be scared of us we're not terrorists or going down certain kind of misconception busting um avenues about yeah women and especially women and you know jihad and all that kind of stuff as opposed to actually talking about what does islam have to offer um people in the west today you know people in any region of the world why should we be adopting islamic morality you know in a time where people's reliance on secular liberalism is ending up uh causing a lot of problems in society and a lot of polarization um and i think that that's a shame i do think that as much as obviously we have different needs as a community we do need to focus on other things and you know i can't profess to be somebody deeply in that sphere either so i'm not saying every single person has to do it but there is a a huge need that we should recognize that we're making sure to be spreading the word of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wherever we are no i agree with you and i think what that word as a concept looks like now is very different and you know the people who are speaking so loudly and proudly about islam about jihad about you know sharia and calling people to islam in that manner are very much viewed through, um, through the extremist lens so people have turned to channeling their efforts in a different way I think mostly now it's the academics, the journalists, and you know activists who have actually filled in the vacuum left by, you know, hard that were and you know scholarly that were in the last few decades. I mean, you know, that were presents itself differently now. The image of the khatib or the imam giving a very inspiring direct sermon for Jum'ah, you know, is unfortunately much less a reality because of the very real consequences they may face. And you know, I'd say now it exists in the form of refutations, where you focus on the other's wrongness to prove Islam's rightness. And you know you can see this in like the sphere of academia, but also you know like in speakers' corner. And then we have apologetics, which where you know the, to clear up misconceptions and sanitize our own image by the very deliberate efforts of others um, to discredit Islam. And then also social justice efforts, where we are we want the Muslim community to embody Islamic values, so people know that this is what Muslims are about, this is what Islam is about, and hopefully that will be enough to you know call people to Islam. Um, I think just generally on a societal level, though, religion has become a very personal thing. So it seems invasive to inquire about others, you know, faith. And just within our own community, the idea is kind of that we must work on ourselves first to improve ourselves first before we look at others. Um, and I feel like this is a very dominant sentiment today, um, which does play into neglecting this word kifaya, like you said, regarding, you know, enjoining good and forbidding evil. Yeah, I think on the back of what you said, Aminan, you know, your your broader question, um, Aisha, uh, I think with 
the kind of how much the world has become a, a global village and how how much access we have to seeing international dawa efforts online we kind of have this i think you know local communities have a tendency to view what's happening in another part of the world and kind of create a, a false how i put this like the priorities become skewed and we kind of get sucked into this echo chamber. I think that's the best way to put it. An echo chamber of like what discussions are happening, what discussions need to be had, what is really on people's minds, not realizing that like what, you know, if I were to take, you know, a YouTuber putting out content in America and think that, you know, the the Dawa approach that he's taking, you know, specifically targeted to American people is exactly the same kind of conversation that needs to be had in Ireland. I think that would be very, you know, sorely mistaken. I think as well of that as well as that the reason I suppose that the one reason that I would think uh, that Dawa efforts are looking different in that sense is also because of of that yeah no I'd say even the methods of approaching a conversation or whether it's the style of Dawa the content of Dawa I think that we are very much kind of uh there's a mirror in front of our eyes and I suppose that is the mirror of social media and the internet which you know leads us to believe you know priorities are different um and very much creates a barrier in us actually going out into our communities of muslims and non-muslims and actually starting conversations from scratch of like what are your concerns how you know really analyzing people in front of us and seeing how we can best present uh, islam to them not just kind of uh, a method that we we take you know verbatim from another source um, and I think that's definitely something that we witness throughout the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He he, you know, gave dawah to different people uh, in different ways. He reached out to different people based on you know their own mindsets, their own backgrounds, their own you know, definitely just really making connections to people on an individual level. And I think that that is something that like an essence of dawah is you know individual applicability that we definitely shouldn't lose and we should be cautious of uh, when we're exposed to so much you know, non-local and, you know, uh, non-personalized efforts from around the world. Yeah, it's interesting that you mention um, social media as a mirror, but also as something that can kind of like exaggerate certain issues to us and like make them look, it, yeah, it's it's a double-edged sword where it'll, it can connect you to people that you might not have otherwise like met at your local masjid or your ISOC or whatever. But at the same time, it, we can see how it has like, like we've, it blows certain issues out of proportion where you now have Muslims who like all of their efforts are focused on like combating feminism. And like, that's like the big boogeyman of, you know, like that's like destroying the Muslim community. And it's like, dude at the local masjid is like kind of unsure whether he like even believes in God. And like the, the sister at the local masjid is just like, you know, she's like facing, maybe she her doubts in Islam come from like a form of abuse that she's faced, like whether from her own family or other community members. And like, those are like, it, it, that's not to say that, you know, the whatever that the liberal boogeyman is like non-existent but it it definitely i think yeah like it it's has served to exaggerate certain issues um and like divert people away from like more immediate concerns um but at the same time i've seen how the internet gathers people that like yeah does otherwise uh would not be involved in like any type of like on the ground Muslim community stuff, whether it's like at a university campus or a masjid or anything else, or like on street dawah corners. Um, and that's like a segment of people that the, I think the traditional like kind of like scholarly establishment is not necessarily always aware of. I think some people are starting to become more aware of it, but it's still through like maybe more mainstream platforms like Twitter or um, like Instagram and stuff. But there's a whole other like segment of the internet on just like, you have like a lot of young people who are using these forums because also like a lot of times they're anonymous they don't have they don't have to like put up those you know like barriers or th those barriers don't exist to like just discussing things like religion or politics in like a very upfront manner um people don't really have to worry about like yeah kind of like the respectability politics around that and so you have people like discussing atheism discussing islam and christianity and the trinity like very extensively i've seen a lot of people you know, kind of like in these forums become Muslim. I've also seen a lot of people in these forums like leave Islam. Not a lot. I would say I've seen some leave Islam and like some actually like start to like generate doubts like because of, you know, like some of the garbage that they've read on like Reddit or whatever. But I would say it's it's definitely like its own um, 
it's an important forum, I think. And I think that that, like, there's always going to be a group of people that are only there and that you just won't encounter in, like, underground Adawa efforts. Yeah, I think it, you know, shows that you need that. I agree with what Fadila was saying in that, you know, we need the local and the local is central to the essence of Dawa. But I hear what you're saying as well, Sarah, and that the way that the world is now, you know, subhanAllah, so many people are just kind of cut off from broader society and we are living with our kind of laptops or our phones or our screens. And, you know, how can we engage that demographic of people, right? And they, mashallah, has what, and, and people even who want to give Dawa in that way, um, you know, because you need to be quite extroverted sometimes as well to give dawah. It can be a little bit intimidating. But that's not to say that people who aren't as confident speaking don't have an amazing amount to contribute. And um, like you're saying, the depth of the knowledge that many people do have, you know, and then and they, and they are contributing in different ways um, is, is very true. As you just said there, Aisha, um, about the need to be a kind of extroverted personality in order to give dawah effectively, especially when we... Um, are doing it in person and on the ground, so to speak. Um, I think it's quite interesting. Something of, um, that's worth noting is the the diversity of of personalities and how that you know, like we mentioned earlier, that dawah is definitely a responsibility not only for a Muslim individual but also for Muslims as a whole. And as part of that, you know, when Allah subhanahu wa taala has you know given us this obligation, He also equipped us with you know, each and every single one of us with the ability to carry out this this obligation upon us. And I think, you know, whether having a more introverted personality, a more abrupt way of speaking, or a more, um, you know, tender way of speaking, I think that there is a place in Dawa for everyone, whether that is, you know, connecting to someone on an emotional level, connecting to someone on an academic or logical level, you know, different people are attracted to Islam and open their hearts or their minds to Islam in different ways. And I think that there, every individual definitely has something to harness in that regard. And a, a really good inspiration for this is the, is the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet wasallam. And, you know, even amongst them, there were so many different personalities. There were people who were, you know, uh, companions radiallahu anhuma who were lighthearted there were some who were known for their fierceness there were some you know known for their um creativity you know and i think that that you know that shows that there definitely is an avenue for every average muslim and there's nothing wrong with being average i think that we also need to understand that dawah isn't for spectacular internet you know superstars you know the average muslim you know has something to offer uh in terms of spreading the message with islam yeah no and that like it's really exemplified in how the prophet وسلم, like he placed people in roles that fit their personalities already and he, he also like trained them and like helped them grow into their roles but um he didn't push people to do things that you know d- didn't already kind of like fit their disposition for example like hassan ibn thabit who was like a known poet even in jahiliya and then when he became muslim the prophet وسلم, like pushed him to use that to aid the cause of Islam and didn't push him to aid the cause of Islam through jihad because like that was something that I personally like he was literally not capable of doing like for he must have like well, explanations that I've heard is like he had faced like some sort of trauma that like just made it difficult for him to like actually go out into battle so he didn't and like he wasn't pushed to do that but he engaged in like a form of you know like yeah like aiding the islamic movement in a way that was extremely effective because of the social context also like poetry and like um that was almost that was kind of like how news spread also is that people would like repeat lines of poetry and that that would spread like very quickly across the different towns versus for example like um you know like mushab was the one who was sent as like an ambassador because like that was you know like he had the kind of like the predisposition he had the like diplomacy um Mu'adh ibn Jabal was like extremely knowledgeable so he was set up as a, like a local imam like for his community and like he would lead the salah like in his you know in his locale so like the, he, these people were placed like in their in roles that like fit their personalities that said there is still something to be said about you know like how people then this happens a lot like people do give dawah training um and like teach people like okay you're gonna be a muslim at, like interacting with non-muslims at some point whether it's in like a formal dawah context or just in your workplace or at school so here's how to go about it um and i, f- I think it's important but i've also had just like mixed experience with it like personally i i remember we had this um yeah we, we had just like a dawah training session with the like a local dawah organization here called ing um and they came to our msa and 
it was just, you know, like a workshop where the like the representative gave us kind of like a packet with like a bunch of like example scenarios, or, like questions that like non-Muslims might come to you with. And it was like very overtly like apologetics oriented and just like like twisting things. Like I I, I don't know, I was sitting there just like my rage was just building up because I was like, this is so straight. And she literally was just like, she just kept saying things like, make sure to not say anything weird. Don't seem extreme. I was like, bro, what? Like, <laughs> it was so like awkward. And it was just like, it was very apologetics oriented. And I've, I've heard other people from this organization too, like just make comments like that, where it's very geared towards like, how do we improve the image of Muslims without really like being concerned about the content of Islam being delivered to people and like in an honest and like wise way. But yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I feel like those things could have so much potential, like just teaching people mm. how to interact with non-Muslims and like how to, you know, yeah, just like, yeah, like be normal, but also be intentional in talking to people about Islam. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if you guys have had like better experiences with Dawah training or anything, but. Yeah, I have had um, Dawah training. I think for Dila, we've done the same one. I did the Aira one back in the day, <laughs> really too many years ago now, subhanAllah, the Go Rap one. But in general as well, like I remember again back in the day learning about the cosmological argument or they had various arguments, right? As to particularly how you take someone through a rational argument to prove the existence of God, right? And like, that's all well and good. I think that at the same time, many people, they do build flexibility into the way in which they teach and they explain that, you know, you're not always going to go according to the script, but ultimately when you get to this point, you need to explain this and this and this. And I think, you know, there those that those those definitely have their place. But I guess that I don't know, my mantra now with respect to Dawa is it depends. Not because there's like no I, I I just don't think there is one way to do it. Um, you know, it really does depend on the situation and on the person in question. I know that with the Go Rap, but also more recently with another um initiative that I was involved with, they very much kind of said, you know what, you can keep answering questions about Islam endlessly. Right. Someone could come and ask you about hijab, ask you about salah, ask you about fasting, ask you about every single ritual and you can give them answers. But ultimately, that's not going to convince somebody. You need to go straight to kind of, you know what, the question, what we need to talk about is God. And once you prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then ultimately acceptance of everything else comes with that. That's true. But I think that in this day and age, with the perceptions that many people do have about Islam, you do need to kind of answer misconceptions. That was what I thought, at least. And then recently when I was in Turkey and I was involved in this program, I realized how far down the misconception route I'd gone, where basically in my interview, they'd asked me a couple of questions about women. And I, being me, went into some big five minute answer about why do women pray at the back and men pray at the front? And after they were like, you didn't talk about Allah. And I was like, oh, so we're doing that kind of thing. And then, so, 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 so that's true, right? Especially with some of these very controversial things where people aren't going to be fully satisfied with a particular answer. I think there is a need to bring that back. However, at the same time, I feel like, and this was kind of very much hitting me when I was in Turkey and I was giving dawah to tourists from different parts of the world. When you have people, especially from countries who perhaps haven't had as intense propaganda about Islam, non-Western countries, um, Eastern Europe or South America, or, you know, countries in, in Africa who have some knowledge of Islam or Japan or Korea or something like that. They, you know, you can talk to them about God in this way and people will be like, oh, okay, this is interesting. And this is a conversation that they want to have. But very often with Westerners, I think it's a completely different story. And I mean, we're all Westerners on here. So although, mashallah, we have so many insights from the t- rest of like the TQP team who is like based in the Muslim world. This for me was something that I was very much able to kind of pinpoint as a Western Muslim that like, you know, when people have a preconceived understanding of Islam, you have to be able to tackle questions at a deeper level. And then the institute I was part of, they also recognized that because I remember there was one time where one of the brothers um, was talking to a big group of people from Western Europe, like Belgium, France, Germany. And some of them, uh, you know, they kind of did their pitch about Allah and the different prophets and it was very much focused on kind of the Abrahamic link and things like that that was how they would incorporate it and they were like okay that's all well and good but how come you guys have like Sunnis and Shias that if it's this simple and they knew about that and they knew about the feud with Ali radiallahu anh, and they were kind of like okay wow this is a whole other kettle of fish that you need to now kind of talk about 
And, you know, when somebody has that, you know, that information from beforehand, like that's a really hard topic to suddenly now have to like in- initiate a discussion about politics and history alongside theological conversation. So for me, this conversation about kind of methods and training is that flexibility needs to be inbuilt into like whatever you're doing um, and obviously tailored to the people who you're talking to and understanding what perspectives and backgrounds they may be coming from. Yeah, I definitely agree on that point. I think as well, when we think about, you know, training uh, and really focusing our efforts, I think it's really important to not lose the end goal. Like what Sara was mentioning earlier about um, whether our end goal is to just improve the general image of Muslims or whether it's to actually call people to Islam and, you know, inshallah, have people accept Islam. I think that, you know, our our headspace going into that affects the kind of training that we give and the kind of priorities we have. Um, I think with the, the misconceptions route, I think it's very interesting. And I think also it ties in with apologeticism that we need to be careful to not just present answers that will make people slightly more comfortable with the idea of Islam the same way people have come around to like alternative political views. So it's like, okay, we can learn a bit about Muslims, what they believe and respect them on that. But that doesn't mean we actually, you know, accept any truth or any inherent value besides them just being able to believe what they want to believe and us respecting that. Um, so I think, yeah, definitely, like you said, uh, the the methods of training and really being focused on delivering that core message is, is always meant to be kept a priority. Yeah, I would like, this is kind of a side point, but I think it's important to mention how like the way that we teach Muslims to like interact with non-Muslims, if, especially if they live, you know, if they go to public school and like they work with non-Muslims and like that's who they interact with most of the time, it starts to influence like their own perception and practice of their deen. So like if we grow up hearing mostly like, okay, here's how to talk to people about hijab, here's how to talk to people about like gender and like jihad and blah, blah, blah. That's how people like actually learn about their deen. Like they learn about it through apologetics and like that they start to like, you know, their own perception of their deen is through that like, like rose colored lens of like, how do we make this palatable to like people who are not even Muslim? And it, like, I think, yeah, that that is really important because even for me, I, I realized like, I was thinking about this, like, while you guys were talking, but growing up, like, my interactions with, like, non-Muslims, when it came to talking about Islam, it often was, like, very overtly political. And, like, even as a kid, like, talking about, like, Palestine, and then in middle school, talking about the Arab Spring, talking about Iraq, Afghanistan, like, that was my interaction with people a lot of the time. And, like, we would, yeah, like, we'd go to, like, protest for, like, Palestine on the weekend, and then I'd come to school and be like, guess what I did on the weekend? And, like, that would be my, like, update for stuff. And, like, that was and that became like really core for me and became really central for me and it still is so i think that that's important to to recognize that like the way that you teach muslims to engage like externally it starts to affect like their own practice and understanding of their deen for better or for worse i guess even for muslims like there is a level of coming across things in our deen that we just have to like like reason with and reconcile and like it has we have to like make it make sense to ourselves but that's kind of like the basic level of just like and then there has to be a point where like we reach a level of like spiritual maturity where we don't have to mm-hmm, do that with mm-hmm. every single issue anymore and we can just kind of like accept that like okay this dean is from allah and like i may not understand everything now but i know that like if it's from allah and if it's from his prophet so i said him it's the truth but like with non-muslims like you can't do that and that this ties back to like what you're saying about you know um like starting with like Allah and establishing the existence of God as like the centerpiece. And like, it is so crucial, but I I still understand like why, you know, sometimes like it, it can't be the first piece when you're talking to non-Muslims, but for Muslims, it has to be. And like, if, but we, if we never even teach them that part, like we never even teach Muslims that like, okay, this is the, like the centerpiece of like Dawah and like just Tawheed, then even for themselves, like they're not able to like really internalize that. I think at least that's what I witnessed in my own community. So yeah, going off of Sarah's point, I think that the way that Islam is often explained to non-Muslims affects the way that Muslims themselves internalize and perceive different aspects of the deen. So one example that I can think of is that when I was growing up, I often heard um, Muslims explain to non-Muslims that hijab is a choice in an effort to push back against the idea that hijab was being forced on Muslim women by their male relatives and that it was used as a tool of oppression. 
And I think this affected the the way a lot of Muslim girls and women viewed hijab. And I think a lot of us started viewing hijab more through this secular liberal lens um, of, you know, choice and freedom and autonomy um, instead of, you know, the... Re- the real reason why we're supposed to wear hijab and how you know it's a commandment and obligation ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yeah no, absolutely I want to give a more controversial example of it than that <laughs> if that's okay um I have some qualms even about saying it here which I think speaks exactly to my point but when you were, guys were talking about you know especially Sada when you're talking about how growing up in a very tense political era how that frames our conversations about Islam I mean, for me, the fact that people still, like, the f- it's the first thing I hear whenever jihad is mentioned is people talking about how the lesser, it's, you know, the lesser jihad is the physical jihad and the, and the greater jihad is jihad is the nafs. What nobody adds on to that is that that is a da'if hadith. It's a weak hadith. And it's ruling, I'm not saying obviously it doesn't apply, scholars do quote it in a particular context, but the way that it is just used as an immediate rebuttal of the idea speaks very much to how when a Muslim community in a difficult, um, you know, political context, stuck between a rock and a hard place, just instrumentalized this ayah to basically, comp- rather than explaining any in any depth the situation that we are witnessing in different parts of the world and why certain reactions erupt and why those are wrong and illegitimate and condemning it, used something from our own tradition to just completely write that off. The fact that that was used is why, unfortunately, I am still kind of saying this is a controversial example because jihad is a taboo word, even in parts of the Muslim community. I would say in the mainstream Muslim community, using it in any context, which is not jihad and nafs, even like devoid of any applicable context. Nobody is talking about a particular reality, but just as an idea, as a concept, unfortunately, is just off limits. Um... And that is a prime example to me of exactly what you guys were saying, where unfortunately, kind of, we get our priorities mixed up, where we don't know if, are we trying to, you know, kind of improve the image of ourselves? Are we trying to teach ourselves about what Islam is? Or are we trying to convert other people? And ultimately, none of those objectives are adequately served. Um, And those are all important objectives, so they all deserve kind of time in, in um, in and of themselves. But yeah. I think jihad is a really good example because it obviously it's like so topical because of like political issues, but also it again, it creates a lot of like misconceptions within the Muslim community where you still have Muslims parroting over and over again that the only type of war that's allowed in Islam is is defensive war. And like it's like the most basic survey of like early Islamic history will show you that that's not the case. Like, why are all of these lands Muslim? You know, it's, it's like it doesn't. It doesn't compute, but it's, yeah, it leads to, you know, and also it's not, I think it's not as hard as people make it seem. And the fact that Muslims are so allergic to talking about it makes it 10 times harder than it needs to be. Like in like classes with like all Muslims, like in, you know, like studying Islamic subjects, I like, I still encounter like people who are just afraid to like even use the word or address it because they're like, oh, you never know who's listening on Zoom. It's like, dude, like they know everything already. Like if you look up books on the, you know, like Islamic books, you'll find them on the CIA website. Like they have all of our content. We might as well just like discuss these issues ourselves. This so, happened like, the other day, right? <laughs> I, yeah, I, dude, no, this literally, happened the other day. <laughs> something Fadila was doing. We got that's what our Google search came up when we were doing our book citations. Yeah, no, and now you you have these, like, surveillance specialists who know more about, like, the fiqh of jihad than we do. And it's, like, if we just, like, it, but that's the thing. I'm not saying that, like, we need to just, like, accept that Islam is a violent religion. No, like, it's just study the history and see that, like, Islam is not exceptional. And, like, early Muslims were not exceptional in, like, the way that they used war. They were exceptional in how they had, like, v- extremely ethical rules of war. That was, like, completely unique to the Muslims and, like, has always been unique to Islam, alhamdulillah. But, like, there's no... It's not hard to show how, like, yeah, of course they had to, like, engage in, like, self-defense and wars and, like, sieges. And they had to deal with, like, certain tribes who, like, you know, broke their treaties a certain way because that's literally how human history has always been. And that's, like, that's what you had to do. And in that context, that, like, they were literally... in Like, they... 
Islam cropped up in a like a, a violent context where like tribal wars were always taking place in the Arabian Peninsula. But that's the thing is like Muslims have to have this discussion amongst themselves, like just confront that history, confront the, you know, yeah, j- like the topic of like jihad and war and like was Islam spread by the sword in order for us to be able to like understand it ourselves and then also convey it to other people because I think that is an important like cornerstone of da'wah and and that's where like a big chunk of the mis- misconceptions about Islam come up when talking to non-Muslims but like if Muslims are so like antsy about it because they're like they're gonna like you know listen to it they already have all of your messages and like you know you're on a list like just just talk about it like it's fine you know it, like it, nothing crazy is gonna come up that you're you realize like oh no like we, we, we're in trouble like it's I'm sure, I promise you it'll be okay but we have to ha- like yeah I, sorry I, I'm glad you brought up the example because I think it's important yeah Oh my goodness. I couldn't agree more. I think definitely there's this tendency to kind of um, frame... I mean, of course, Islam is for every time and every place throughout history, but I think there's this kind of tendency sometimes when giving da'wah to relegate certain matters of fiqh or certain, you know, aspects of Islamic history to history. And even, you know, in presenting it, in, in presenting Islam to, to non-Muslims, it's almost like, oh, well, that was something that, you know, previous Muslims would be concerned about, but for us, it's not relevant at all anymore, which is absolutely not true. And I think that there needs to be um, a sense of, uh, integrity and a sense of duty to actually presenting Islam as the holistic worldview at, that it is uh, and not omitting any parts or kind of contextualizing something as justifiable back then or justifiable now because you know the you know Allah's law is Allah's law and I think again it ties back to apologeticism and you know really just stating that you know of course like with women's issues, for example, whether that's women traveling without mahrams or, you know, inheritance and the kind of social security that needed to be given to needs to be given to women uh, in families or, or vulnerable people in society. You know, we 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 do accept that, you know, scholars have, uh, you know, differed in their opinions as time went on. But we can never really we have to be careful not to stray too far from you know, the original wording of hadith or, you know, the original context of Quran. And it's funny because we always use context in a way that serves us best, I think, when giving da'wah, um, being like, that was for then, this is for now. Whereas, you know, if we're actually, you know, doing context justice, looking at the context of verses in the Quran, whether, you know, they were revealed at times of war or at, at times of, you know, uh, social disarray, uh, I think that would, would speak more truly to the actual, you know, sharia. Mm-hmm. See, I feel like some of the things that you've spoken about here, Fadila, of like context and history and using it, that can often come across in a much more holistic and organic way uh, when these kinds of conversations take place in a more interfaith um, dynamic, right? So I guess now kind of implicitly, perhaps the, at least the assumption that I've had when I'm talking about things are, you know, situations of the hard da'wah that you were talking about, where people go out and they're, it, it, it's their kind of like missionary work, right? Um but I've actually really enjoyed having genuine interfaith conversations. Um, when I was doing my undergraduate, there, we had a Christian Muslim dialogue society that I ended up, you know, kind of attending so much, they just like made me a committee member. But like, there were some amazing Christians there. And a couple of them, uh, one of them, she was married to a guy who was Coptic Christian from Egypt. And just because of my university, everybody was studying, and she was studying Islamic studies. But Aside from kind of the unique background of the actual participants, it was a really nice environment. Um, Coming back to, I guess, what Sarah said, where because the UK is very secular, being in an environment where you can speak about Islam and the importance of religion and have other people, you know, giving their opinion. And it wasn't kind of all just like, oh, yes, we are all like together and nobody challenges anyone. People did challenge, people did ask, but people made intelligent arguments. It wasn't about necessarily converting one another, but it was about really trying to understand what are the differences, what are the similarities, and then what are the differences. And I think those thought-provoking conversations can, in the long run, you never know what kind of change they could lead to as well. But unfortunately, I feel like interfaith, at least in the UK, to me, has a bit of a bad rep because, again, back in the day, there were um, initiatives that the government kind of tried to set up in order to kind of further subtly their kind of counter extremism like program. They they organized these things and had people try and have these conversations 
for the sake of the that kind of apologetics that we were just talking about, right? So it kind of can go either way. But I wanted to ask you guys about any experience with interfaith you've had or, or how you feel that works in contrast with some of the other methods we've been talking about. Yeah. I just a brief point on interfaith is that like I think it's a it's good and it's it it's good especially for like aiding kind of like the immediate concerns of the Muslim community and just like you know, making sure that they have like, yeah, people that they can ally on like immediate local community issues on political issues. Um, but also like one thing that makes me um, apprehensive about it is kind of like this dawa at all costs attitude that sometimes Muslims can have where it's like we are, you know, it, it's an important thing and we have to talk to these people about Islam, regardless of like, who they like which organizations like they're coming from regardless of like what we have to end up then kind of um like implicitly affirming which is like you'll see muslims yeah like inviting cops or having interfaith events with like it's like really zionist organizations mm. i think um MLI. i forget which msa yeah, yeah the mli like lit- yeah. mli is just zionism it's not even like <laughs> you can't even s- pretend that there's like a dawa element there it's literally like by the israeli government but um and there was like some msa that was like trying to do an interfaith event with hillel which is like i don't know if you guys if it's the same in the uk yeah it's it's like jewish student organizations right but the organization itself is like extremely extremely zionist and like like Jewish students themselves who are not Zionist, like who are pro-Palestine, like don't associate with it because of like how extremely like overtly Zionist it is. So like you have, yeah, stuff like that where Muslims are like, but there's a broader purpose where we have to like talk about Islam and like teach these people. It's like, no, all you're doing is saying that like, we're going to hold events with Hillel. We're going to use our funding to like, you know, hold an event with these people and like act like, you know, they're not supporting like the murder of our brothers and sisters. Like it, it's, this is the stuff that like makes me really apprehensive about interfaith work is that like it's like okay let's set aside let's set aside our like our political concerns and like it diminishes the importance of like the political it it turns the political into this kind of like profane thing where it's like ugh, it's like this unfortunate like you know accidental reality but if we can just ignore it for a moment and focus on our like what we have in common like we can do dawah to these people like no like that dawah is not a priority above like not supporting people who like hate Islam and Muslims. I think that's like, yeah, that is what makes me apprehensive about interfaith, but that's a very specific segment of it. No, but to be honest, like it's specific, but I think it's it's a very real concern in the US. So that's, I think it's, it's really good you brought it up because that's the problem with interfaith that it can just be manipulated so easily because you're relying on the other party to come there with good intentions. And sometimes that's not the case. Yeah, just to jump in there, I'd say my experience with interfaith, it was actually, I suppose, my gateway to Dawah, I guess, from, from quite a young age. Um, but I suppose growing older, I've I've developed a lot more skepticism, a lot more skepticism and cynicism for uh, interfaith work, mainly because like the more I thought about like what I was involved in, particularly in my own community, I just found that, you know, there needs to be I think we need to always, you know, maintain an element of, not an element of, but it needs to be, the the driving force needs to be maintaining the integrity of Islam and just being sincere in how you present Islam. And I just, I found I had issues with, you know, Islam being presented as one of many truths, you know, or, you know, just basically perennial ways of thinking really, like, the more I thought about them, I think it's, it's not adequate to present islam that way and i think again like i mentioned earlier just making islam more palatable uh, as something for people to respect and just be aware of um i don't think is very useful i don't think awareness so to speak is has ever really been an aim of dawah like i think people are pretty aware that islam exists and muslims exist for better or for worse so you know the efforts do need to be kept quite streamlined and i think interfaith work is is such a slippery slope uh you know like you mentioned earlier, Sarah, you know, allyship is really, really important. And I think, especially when we think of Ahl al-Kitab, like we have so much to unite with them upon, especially in preserving our own, you know, social values in the face of, you know, the tide of liberalism. Um, But that doesn't really justify singing Kumbaya with, you know, anyone and everyone like you and Aisha mentioned earlier. Um, it's, It's just ingenuine. And I don't think it ever really furthers the cause of Islam or or the cause of Muslims, I'd say, because there does also need to be, you know, 
consideration for for we're not only you know promoting islam but you know we are representing our fellow muslims and the ummah as a whole every time we do speak uh on behalf of islam so you know kind of downplaying that and and shaking hands with people who are oppressing our brothers and sisters is i think disrespectful and i think also doesn't display uh, a really good image of muslims in terms of their solidarity for fellow muslims i think that could be quite insulting as well i think you guys have both raised like very valid points i think i perhaps i have a more romanticized view of like interfaith as just like really nice sincere people at my university who were also extremely knowledgeable about islam and muslim cultures and so just extremely appreciative and everybody wanted to come together to talk about god and you don't find many of those spaces but um as we kind of i guess dig deeper into how we feel some of these methods you know kind of the, what what are the what are the positives what are the negatives what else do you guys feel like i guess obviously speaking in general the community um gets right or gets wrong when it comes to 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 dawa efforts in general I think my main issue is people deciding who fits the criteria for receiving that one, as in, you know, who we should engage with and who we shouldn't, as if, you know, this person is too far gone. And we often see criticism of people for simply platforming certain personalities or engaging with, like, a certain individual. And you know, this happens on both sides of the spectrum, where people have cancelled yaqeen for engaging with, with liberal lefty types, and the other side criticises Shah Hamza Yusuf or Mohammed Hijab for, you know, speaking with Jordan Peterson. And it's something I have found difficult to grapple with, uh, grapple with myself. But, you know, Nasiha is for everyone. And at the end of the day, I think engagement is key. And, you know, Islamic scholars especially, I think we should they should be invested in such dialogues and discussions um, across the spectrum from like lib rights to Tories, liberals to far right racists, because on the topic of Islam, who better is there for such a job? And we need learned people to represent Islam. And if Islam is for everyone, then that is everyone. No ifs or buts. But, you know, Islam is a religion of proselytizing and Allah guides whom he wills. And we have seen enemies of Islam become the most beloved of mankind during the time of the Prophet. So why can we not extend that to today? And I know modernity brings its own issues, but, you know, our hearts are still soft and you know, our communities are still fertile for spreading and receiving the message of Allah. So I think what we need to focus on more is just the type of engagement, because a conversation itself is not always that one. And if you are going to publicly discourse with problematic people, people who do have a dubious reputation, people who have said things that are insulting to our faith, to our communities, then you need to challenge them on those issues. Um, because it is not enough to just focus on the common ground and your hope that you know, that is what will unite you. And you need to remember that, you know, in your efforts to invite people to Islam, you do not let down and alienate the people who are already in your community and who may feel betrayed by seeing you cozying up, cozying up with such individuals. Like, I think these conversations need to happen. They need to be sincere and in good faith, but they also need to be with a purpose and not just focusing on the one little common interest that they may be. So I don't really think that there is a one size fits all approach when it comes to da'wah or that we need to stick to a certain template every time we're giving da'wah um, because I feel like different audiences um, are open to different approaches more. Um, and I think that it's important to cater our approaches based on the temperaments of the audiences we are speaking to because I feel like some audiences may prefer, um, you know, or may be more open to emotional appeals while other audiences may be more receptive to logical arguments. So I think that it's important to keep that in mind. But I do remember coming across this tweet a couple of months ago, um, mentioning that if the primary reason for someone converting to Islam was, you know, an emotional reason, um, that they were more likely to leave Islam later on. So I don't know. What are y'all's thoughts on that? I don't think emotion is a bad thing. I think that it, this may be controversial, but I think it matters less about why people are, you know, drawn to Islam. And it matters more that they stay and more that they, you know, I think we we hear so many examples of, of stories of, uh, of reverts, whether contemporary or, you know, from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu or, you know, even in the, the eras in between, who came to Islam, you know, from a point of researching Islam and then ending up re realizing its true essence or, you know, 
being in a relationship with a Muslim man, particularly for women, I guess, but, you know, being in, in a relationship with a Muslim man and then learning about Islam through him. And I, I think that actually, now that it comes to mind, I think that that's one uh, reason that uh, some women convert. And I think that it's very much looked down upon. Um, but I think that that's, that's rather unfair uh, to dismiss emotions or to d- dismiss kind of the romantic connection that people can make with Islam. Like, you know, just, I think we have this tendency to venerate academic or philosophical, you know, conclusions to, to be drawn to Islam, um, over the kind of more everyday human, uh, reasons that I think a lot more people would experience, like, you know, on an average level. I suppose, you know, whether they came from researching Islam and then realizing its essence or, you know, meeting Muslims and, you know, loving Muslims, it matters more that we're able to, you know, after their initial engagement with Islam, further kind of solidify emotions with knowledge. And I think that is a testament to to the Muslim experience for everyone, you know, whether born Muslim or not. No one who is a Muslim is Muslim solely because of opinions or solely because of, you know, how their heart feels. It's a combination of both and it's an intelligent combination of both. Um, so I think, you know, it, it is a bit, I find it unfair. And I think I th- we might mention this early, uh, later, but, you know, with women in particular, when it comes to discussing emotions in Dawah, whether they're Muslim, uh, Muslim women giving Dawah um, from an emotional viewpoint or people becoming Muslim because of emotions I think that that is something that's kind of looked down upon which I think is unfair and kind of diminishes the the value of the heart and you know the, the intelligence of these people who who are doing these things yeah I agree and I think in general emotion is used as a pejorative to describe anything that you wouldn't find written in an academic journal article or you know some like advanced philosophical argument for the proofs of God which it kind of begs the question about who is actually reading those things and who comes to Islam through those modes of da'wah. And I'm not dismissing the importance of those things. I think that they do have a function and they're important for some people. And they're they're even important for Muslims who, you know, are trying to um, grapple with other like philosophical arguments that they've heard and they're trying to make sense of their deen. Um, so those things are important, but I don't think that 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 is how the bulk of people come to Islam or that that's what strengthens people's Iman. Um, and I really don't think that that applies to how the majority of people became Muslim during the life of the Prophet wasallam. For example, there is a story of this man named Fadala ibn Umayr عنه, who before he became Muslim, he during the conquest of Mecca, the Prophet wasallam. this is when the Muslims had basically just arrived and the Prophet is making tawaf around the Kaaba and Fadala is watching him from afar and he just he's not muslim at this point he thinks to himself how easy it would be for him to kill the prophet وسلم, because he's just exposed out in the open um and you know the muslims had just come and conquered his home city so i guess he's feeling some kind of resentment and the prophet وسلم, looks at him and he's just thinking this to himself but the prophet sees him looks at him and comes to him and asks him what he's thinking and falala was like oh i, I was just doing the kid and the prophet وسلم, laughs and tells him to ask Allah to forgive him. So it seems the Prophet ﷺ had an inkling of what was going on inside this man's head. But then Fadala says that in the narration he, that he's explaining about like you know, the story of his conversion, he says that the Prophet ﷺ put his hand on his chest and looked him in the eye until he became the most beloved person to him. So you see here in an instant of person going from thinking about killing the Prophet Sallallahu to loving him more than anyone else in the world. There's no, it, this is, somebody would describe this as like purely emotional, that he was just overcome with emotion at how the Prophet Sallallahu spoke to him and treated him and l- looked him in the eye. But this is the case, like especially yeah, towards the end of the seerah, a lot of people, thousands of people became Muslim all at once because their tribe had become Muslim, the leader of their tribe would go make a treaty with the Muslims, become Muslim, and then go back and teach their tribe. Maybe they would go back with one or a few Sahaba to teach their own tribe about Islam, and then everybody would just mass convert all at once. And maybe to our sensibilities, it doesn't really make sense. Like, how could, you know, how do these people just become Muslim? They didn't spend six months reading a translation of the Quran first, and then they realize that Islam is the truth. But no, this is how people work generally. And I think that we also don't realize how much we work in the same way where we just follow people that we respect for various reasons. And during 
this time, during the time of the Prophet وسلم, people definitely respected displays of power and displays of glory and this is also exemplified actually in how the prophet وسلم, told the muslims to how, what he told the muslim men to do when they went for umrah and this is before the conquest of mecca but once the muslims were actually able to perform umrah he did as they were coming to mecca also the meccans had this expectation that the muslims had been you know they had emigrated leaving behind most of their belongings in mecca they had arrived in Medina with very little wealth to their name. There was an illness that would always that was very well known for going around in Medina, so a lot of the Muslims became sick. So the Quraysh in Mecca were kind of expecting the Muslims to show up looking weak and pathetic, and they were waiting to watch them, you know, arriving in Mecca and watching them perform their Umrah. And so the Prophet Sallallahu tells the men during the during the first few rounds of their Tawaf to walk quickly and walk taking short steps and kind of swinging their shoulders as a display of strength and also to uncover their right shoulder. So you'll notice when you see men wearing ihram that oftentimes their right shoulder is uncovered. And that's because when you do tawaf, your left side is facing the Kaaba and your right arm is facing outwards. So the Quraysh who are watching the Muslims performing tawaf are seeing their right side. Prophet Sallallahu tells them to uncover that, that shoulder and arm as a display of strength. And this is something that is very impactful at the time. And this is something that is still impactful today, maybe in different ways, because in our society, physical strength doesn't guarantee a person's social status as and their, their protection as much as it would have at that time. But other things that, you know, really influence us, like for us, we don't realize how much people's physical appearance and even their eloquence and just oratorical skills really influence us um, and convince us of that person's trustworthiness and of their intelligence and their integrity more than, you know, like these rational decisions and it's hard for us to admit sometimes that we don't make every decision by weighing out the pros and cons and really thinking about it but oftentimes we just emulate people who we respect for various reasons and this was definitely the case during the prophet and i think we also have to ask ourselves that can we sit here and say that those conversions you know people who convert with their family or with their tribe or just because they're emotionally overcome by the presence of the prophet or maybe by the treatment of the the companions are those conversions any less valid? Is it better for somebody to remain a disbeliever than to, you know, suddenly take up take the shahada with the rest of their tribe and then slowly learn about the deen and maybe become a more committed Muslim later, or maybe not become a that much more of a committed Muslim later, but at least have taken the shahada and, you know, secured their salvation in some way, bi I think that I don't think that we can say that one, you know, that, that those conversions are not valid or that they're unideal. Um, because this is how the majority of people became Muslims in the beginning. Yeah. I think what you're literally talking about, Sarah, as, as, as I'm hearing you give all of these examples, which are amazing, by the way. I did not know this about um, men having to uncover their shoulder for this particular reason. But it's it's soft power at the end of the day, right? The idea that people are only convinced by arguments or, or the strength of ideas is, is ultimately false. I mean, so much of what you're talking about can be said exactly for the American empire as, as we have it today. Look at how many people look up to them and want to learn English and know all of the music and the shows that are coming out and dress like them in various parts of the world because ultimately they have that soft power as well as obviously being a superpower. But for me, you know, we have a really good article <laughs> on the website particularly about this by Rashta, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. But um, her article on how scientific arguments for proving Islam fall short, I think really, really illustrates how when people rely so much on the rational scientific proof, when that falls through, ultimately it can shake people's deen a lot. You know, there has to be an element of, of course, yeah, proving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, things like that, we know those things can be rationally uh, proven. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that, you know, he's given us proof right? The Qur'an and obviously other things in his creation are proofs of his existence. But with respect to so many other things, there's not necessarily going to be the same level of proof. And when people draw on that and pull on those examples, I've started to have a lot of mixed feelings about it, especially since I've read Rushta's article, because mashallah, she like researched it really well. And I'm suddenly like, what? You're telling me that this and this and this actually, you know, doesn't necessarily correspond the way we think it does. But very often in kind of common vernacular, you see these things um, being used. But this is the thing. Yeah, faith isn't based just on that. One thing actually that was really beautiful was that when I was um, in Turkey recently, and I keep referencing this experience because it's related to today, but it was also very recent. 
subhanAllah, it was quite smart that, mashallah, the people who set up this center set it up the way they did because the amount of people who come into, obviously the masajid in Turkey are beautiful and they do it at two of the main masajid in Istanbul. You know, they come in and they just cry at the beauty of the mosque, right? They hear the adhan and they see people going to pray and they're just so overwhelmed. They just know like something deep down them and they just sit there. And this was the thing that, you know, if people are sitting there for like, 15, 20, 25 minutes, half an hour, people sat there for an hour just sitting there, then you know what? You should definitely go and speak to them because something is affecting their heart in a way that arguments alone, all the arguments could could not touch, right? And that's why obviously the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran have power. And when they hear that as well, there's something different that goes on there. So I think that tweet, I would, I don't think there's any evidence for that. I can't even say I'd like to see the evidence because I, I don't think it exists. <laughs> SubhanAllah. No, I couldn't agree more, actually. Um, perhaps, Sara, you were kind of, you know, going in a different direction, but I think you actually and Aisha made a really good point about soft power there um, and kind of the displays of Izza and like the the demeanor of Muslims in and of itself and how that can, can be dawah. I think even nowadays, um, the Muslim lifestyle is something that people aspire to whether or not they realize it you know we see a lot i mean this is the era of like productivity culture and like hustle culture and you know rise and grind so to speak but you know the idea of waking up and praying fajr like consistently without fail and you know that is the time that everyone's recommending you wake up now or like the idea of being disciplined and not drinking alcohol like not even a sip yeah you know that kind of stuff really does stand out when when muslims do portray themselves as firm in their beliefs and you know people of discipline people of you know honor i suppose and that does give a kind of respectability um without a doubt and you know there are so many examples from within the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu being this beautiful character, not only with this, you know, speaking about Islam and obviously with his words, portraying the message of Islam. But of course, we know that his character in itself was the, you know, a walking Quran and just his presence, you know, had an effect on people. And I think that that is, you know, a part of da'wah that we shouldn't forget about, especially, you know, as as Muslims living in the West, if we are, you know, shy to do certain things or explain why we do what we do or, you know, justify our actions, that being firm and presenting oneself as firm is part of the Muslim character. And everything about the Muslim character, you know, naturally uh, aligns with the fitrah. And that is something that can be awakened in non-Muslims who witness us, you know, living Islam. And I actually think that that ties in to the, to the question we kind of started with of how we could kind of improve as 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 communities when it comes to dawah i think the first thing you know relating to the muslim character again is just this idea that we can't say do as i do not as i no sorry do as i say not as i do i think we can't overemphasize the importance of good character whether you know we see it when we're seeking knowledge we see it you know in matters of fiqh and it's not just this theoretical idea of believing in allah it's how we live that in in everything we do um, so I think Muslims should definitely be content and be firm in their in their Muslim identity before giving da'wah. I want to say before giving da'wah as if, you know, we don't give da'wah until we're perfect Muslims. But definitely keep that in mind and, you know, just know that when we do what we do, whether that's walking down the street in hijab or being firm in, you know, refusing certain things or being open about partaking in certain things, that in itself is da'wah and we shouldn't belittle any good deed as, of course, we were taught by the Prophet Sallallahu um, But now that I've mentioned hijab, I suppose um, it it does remind me that we shouldn't really be content with reductionism, I say, uh, when it comes to hijab, whether that's as a fashion statement or this like hyper focus on representation. I think that that doesn't really um, bring us much as much benefit as we think it does. Um, whether that's, you know, having hijabi models or, you know, letting having non-Muslims who are familiar with the phrase, inshallah, like, I don't think that that is actually presenting Islam in its essence and visibility or, you know, familiarity with Islam 
is is actually quite shallow. And I think that, you know, there's so much more that we have to offer, obviously, than just, you know, the, the cultural aspect of like, oh, there's a really nice halal restaurant or, you know, this, you know, popular influencer wears hijab and, you know, still does, you know, the exact same things as everyone else. I think that that kind of definitely sells Islam short. I just wanted to add on to something that Nurhan mentioned about adapting to certain communities. Um, sometimes certain individuals who maybe were a part of communities who were anti-Muslim or just non-Muslim previously, um, they may have a better insight into how to get through to them, better than someone who is an outsider. So if you do see someone engaging with people who are far-right racist or who are very you know, liberal leftist um, people, like maybe it's because they have a shared background, they understand how the people think, how they live, and that's why they can then cater Islam towards them or cater their that word to them. Um, adapt to them and maybe try to maybe what happens is they create a type of islam for example we were talking last week about how you know there is the existence of a british islam to you know um to kind of engage people who have very strong british values um or even like in more ghettoized areas in london the type of that were given looks very different to that in cambridge and i've seen people criticize it by saying you know this quality of the that is poor why are you lowering standards because you know certain scholars were speaking in a harsh way or using slang But that's maybe how to sometimes engage with these communities. And those on the ground, the scholars who reside in these localities and are in contact with them, they know the best, isn't it? And, you know, similarly, getting through to a white middle-class Tory community will require a whole different approach. And it would be alienating for both if someone so far removed from what they know and care about approaches them on such issues. And I think we need to understand that it's almost a different strokes for different folks type of approach, where... You know, if it's within the limits limits of what is permissible, of you know what the Sharia allows, then you know, Alhamdulillah, then maybe we should. It's 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 not an issue, and I you know I don't want to be overly critical, and I love my community a lot, and I appreciate the efforts muchly, but just to speak with them, you know, the UK community, or maybe actually the whole digitalized that was sphere, but you know, a lot of it has become a means of entertainment. It relies on owning their payment rather than you know a sincere effort in guiding them, and um. You know, we have very complex issues which scholars took years and years to study and teach. Just reduced to easy to watch snappy videos, you know, with like a very clickbait title. And quite often, you know, people do neglect their adab and akhlaq as well. And you know, I think we need to realise that, you know, dawah is diverse, but and it's adaptable, but it should also be sophisticated and respectful. And I think whilst appreciating, appreciating the dawah of diversity, we also need to remember that there is an etiquette of dawah as well. Um... That you know, it leaves it's you know, it leaves a lot of room for doing that one in different ways, but in ways that are most pleasing to Allah. No, I definitely agree, Amina, and like that is, like I think th- that's also it speaks to like why it's important for different types of Muslims to see themselves as having a role in dawah because like, like each person can relate to somebody who comes from a similar background as them, and that like that alone makes you very well placed to talk to specific people about Islam in a way that even somebody who's like much more maybe knowledgeable in the traditional sciences just can't. So I think that that's an important point. Um, Also kind of transitioning to, yeah, like somewhat of a different topic, but um, we were talking earlier about there's kind of like a general, at least like a much smaller proportion of, you know, people involved in the quote unquote Taoist scene are women. Um, And I want to ask you guys, like, if you've noticed that maybe I'm, it's just something that I'm seeing or, um is that the case why is it the case is that something that we should actually focus on like should we be encouraging more women to get involved in that you know what subhanallah this is something that i've i think has always been there but it's become more apparent to me recently i feel like i was i was very lucky alhamdulillah when i was younger and that i did see a lot of muslim women who were active in the community and active on a variety of, of, of different issues. You had people talking about identity and Muslim youth problems. You had people talking about spiritual things. You had people talking about political things. And you had people talking on, on Dawa stalls. Like, I was the kind of assistant, like, at, at the Dawa stall, right? Like, it was other sisters, including my mum, who was, you know, up there, mashallah. So I kind of saw that and I was like, yeah, this is the norm. And then now as I've got older, and obviously as well, the scene has shifted, as we were all saying in the beginning. And I just feel like, you don't see women in that space as much at all anymore. And it has very much become a male dominated area, especially as it's shifted online, because, you know, the nature of some some of those discussions is that no sane woman wants to expose themselves to that kind of like hate and argumentation. It's, it's, it's more about those elements of the, of, of the, 
of the activity, I guess, as opposed to necessarily always about the topic at hand. But I think that that's a huge shame. And I really think it would be great if Muslim women were to kind of do these things more. And I don't doubt, again, as usual, that the expertise exists. I just think that there's not necessarily enough platforms that are encouraging Muslim women to actually get into that and providing opportunities that suit them, right? But not everybody is going to want to be on a stall. And that is totally fine. And again, I think with the security situation as it is today, it's, it's very different to what it was in, in the past. Probably, you know, shouldn't be a thing. Same with kind of, you know, making a YouTube video and, you know, arguing or the like kind of three, four video back and forth response with an ex-Muslim. Like definitely not something that I think Muslim women need to be getting into. But is there space for Muslim women to go out there and start engaging with their local communities or online in different forums on these topics? Absolutely. And this was something that, again, um, with my most recent work, when I went to, to Turkey, something that struck me was that the majority of people that were working at this institution were women. And they were young women as well, mashallah. And actually, she's an amazing sister, mashallah, and she does um, follow the Qadrin Project, so she could be listening to this now. But there was a particular sister there who, mashallah, was like, I can't remember her exact age. She was at university, so she was no um, older than like 21, 22. And she had like the record for converting like the most people, the way she would bring them in, mashallah. My first day there, they were like, she is mashallah really good she brings in everyone stick with her if you want to see a shahada and it was just like such a beautiful thing to see that you know a young muslim woman literally has has that reputation and not even just young then there was another sister i met who was subhanallah the same age as my mom uh and she had been so active throughout her life in community work in malaysia with her masjid and she really loved giving dawah and she moved from Malaysia to Turkey, literally to work at this center. I saw she'd just come at the, around the same time as me. And she was there every single day, a woman in her 50s, like giving dawah to people and, you know, speaking to them. Some of them people were, obviously people who were Muslim already, Malay tourists, but sometimes they were Chinese Malay, so they spoke in Malay, she would be speaking to them in that. She was learning Turkish herself. She's speaking to other people in English. It was such a beautiful sight to see like two ends of the spectrum. Um, and then even when my own mom came for a visit, she came to the center as well. And there was like a conversation with a Belgian couple for like four or five hours talking about things in a way that kind of going back to what we were saying, kind of appealing to the problems and the misconceptions and the understandings of kind of um, a broader society and, 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 the, and the, the liberal argumentation that we see today, having a really deep detailed conversation about that. And so I was just like, here are like three of many amazing examples out there. And I would just love it. I think it would do benefit to that sphere to have more Muslim women involved and bringing an element of calm, I want to say, <laughs> to the scene and just kind of, you know, a different approach, a different strategy, but at the same time conveying what is obviously the, 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 the same message, um, you know, and accessing, inshallah, more people. Yeah, regarding the, the topic of Muslim women in Dawah, I think that, you know, there is the need for for Muslim women to definitely uh, be taking part in perhaps in a different way in dawah to non Muslims, not necessarily replicating the the method that we see becoming popular among Muslim brothers. But though the majority of this conversation has been centered on dawah to non Muslims, I think that there's definitely a big gap that needs to be filled by Muslim women, you know, within the Muslim community. Uh, especially on, on, of course, the topic of women's issues, it's always more helpful. I think it, it reaches further, you know, hearing about certain matters from fellow Muslim women who understand the experience. There's definitely less defensiveness. And I think that this also kind of drives back to the need for more female scholarship. Um, and I think, I suppose, once that ground is covered, there's endless opportunities for Muslim women, you know, to work within their own communities and, you know, non-Muslim communities and definitely just spreading the message of Islam. There's a lot of work for women to be done. And I definitely agree with Aisha and Sarah there that there is a space for Muslim women. Yeah, no, definitely. That's the, like, I think it's important to to mention that, like, yeah, dawah to like other Muslim women themselves, because me as a Muslim woman, like there's something I gain from like listening to like sheikhat that I that I don't gain from, like, that I don't necessarily gain from listening to men's scholars, not because they have less knowledge or because I just trust them less, but just, you know, there's something about, like, having a shared experience and somebody who can, like, connect with you on a personal level, somebody that you can have, like, more private conversations with that is, 
you know, like it, it's it's very helpful for a person's like spiritual development. So um, it's always, yeah, it's always important to emphasize that. Um, and I think w now we can sort of wrap up the conversation by just talking about, um, you know, moving forward for people who are listening to this and a lot of it sounds nice in theory, or maybe they've seen Dawa from a distance, but they've never seen a place for, um, in it for themselves. What, you know, advice would you give or what things do, would you want to emphasize for Muslims moving forward when it comes to engaging in Dawa themselves? Um... I have a lot of opinions about this. I think that there's uh, there's definitely so many avenues uh, that we can explore as communities to, you know, increase the quality of dawah that we give and also just involve new voices uh, in, in the output to non-Muslims in particular. But I suppose, you know, there is the need, though, I, like I said before, I wouldn't say that this is a prerequisite to giving dawah because we should definitely not, you know, fall into the trap of thinking that only perfect Muslims can give dawah, but I would definitely say there there is a need to work on on character and you know learn more about the religion to a certain degree of course although we can transmit there there is value in transmitting anything we know you know even if it's just one verse of the quran or one hadith of the prophet or any little amount that we know about islam it's definitely beneficial to to be firm to to some degree and to be content as well with with our religion. And I think that that also ties in with clearing up any doubts of our own and developing a genuine love and pride for our Muslim identity. Um, and I think that definitely once you develop a love for Allah and his messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it, it becomes natural to want to give da'wah. And then you're, you become a lot less concerned. At least I found from my own experience, you could become a lot less concerned about, you know, whether you have the right personality or whether you're equipped with all the rhetorical tools, but you just are so interested in spreading this, you know, beautiful gift of Iman, you know, with the world. And I think that once you've kind of cleared those doubts and, are firm in your Muslim identity, da'wah definitely comes naturally. Um, and it makes, it, it definitely gives you a confidence, like a, like we were talking about before, that soft power in the, in the Muslim identity. Um, the confidence, the likability, the steadfastness, all of that comes through in da'wah. And again, I, I'm not saying that without these ingredients, the, you know, one person isn't a qualified candidate to give da'wah, but these definitely help. And I think that we should also not stray too far from home. Like we said before, there were pros and cons in the kind of globalized and, you know, internet-based dawah, but um, we should definitely always remember that, you know, dawah does begin at home. <laughs> I don't know if that's a saying, but it, it definitely begins with, you know, our immediate family and friends. At times, these are the hardest audiences, and I think that it's also important to remember not to get caught up in the show business of dawah like we were mentioning before that we see online and just keeping it real and keeping it sincere and having difficult conversations which you know conversations that may be difficult i suppose with people who we interact with on a daily basis um and just again keeping away from that apologeticness and keeping sincere and keeping open just um, i guess my last few points are linking up with local mosques and local organizations that are doing work that you appreciate in Dawa, I think that also, you know, is quite helpful. I found it's quite helpful, uh, especially if it is intimidating to start from scratch and think that you have to develop your own personal Dawa technique and find your own audience. And, you know, there, there are organizations that have been doing this for years. They know where people come from, you know, they know where the audience comes in and it's, you know, definitely easy to get training from them, you know, benefit from their expertise and apply, you know, the tried and tested methods that have been working for them. Um, and, you know, maybe perhaps your local communities don't have the best DAWA approaches. There's no harm in being the change you wish to see in that regard. Again, that this is a positive element of the the internet culture of DAWA, but we can learn a lot from what other people are doing and take the best of it and apply it to our own circumstances. And, you know, by Allah's grace, uh, you know, that could definitely be successful. Um, so I suppose also you could harness the power of social media, but I say that with a strong caveat because I'm, I'm always between two minds about, you know, the harms and benefits. Mashallah, Fadila, you got some really good points there. I think um, like I need, I'm going to need to like, Mashallah, listen to that again, because I think it's it's so true that much of that change starts with the approach that we we decide to take and kind of, you know, those starting steps can seem really intimidating, but the, some of the things that you suggested, mashallah, are really, really good places to start. 
I think on that point of you saying, you know, reach out to local massages and see what's going on. I think that's a really good point. I think so much about interaction these days is virtual, but it's really good to rediscover the local and, you know, start with what's familiar and just get into conversing with somebody in a way that is natural first and foremost, before just jumping into like, you know, online debates on arguments in a comment section or a forum or or even making videos or something like that. I think in general, it's also important, I guess coming back to Amina's point that she made earlier, in that, you know, there are different audiences out there. That was Norhan's point, actually, that there are different audiences out there and that, you know, different techniques are needed for those different audiences. And we see so much cancelling going on of, oh my gosh, this person is, you know, so much like this, this person is so much like that, this person is like compassionate imam, I, I hate that phrase, but you know, people using that, versus this person is like, you know, so horrible and harsh, and it, there's just too much, not even negativity, I think it's just short-sightedness, so we can't see that different approaches are needed in different situations. And once we kind of accept that, okay, yeah, these things, we need a plethora of types of engagement we just become a lot more tolerant and we are also able to pick more appropriately what technique is needed for that particular situation rather than thinking it's this way or the highway there's only one way to do the hour no there's many ways and sometimes your way might not always be appropriate for that situation so learn from others as to how to change it um but i think that obviously that doesn't you know deny the fact that Again, as Amina said, adab is something to be conscious of. And I don't like the way people talk about adab policing, just in general now, as though like, this is not something we should be doing. Yes, of course, we should be policing our adab about things. Um, you know, there's definitely times where people use it inappropriately. They, 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 you know, they use the adab label to condemn anyone for saying anything. But really, let's be honest, all of us should be more conscious about adab, especially in the online world than probably we are. And I think the last thing, I mean, it's something we didn't talk about today, but I think that's fair enough because our topic today was quite specific. But also that anybody who's involved in this work, I think needs to be conscious of the convert or revert experience of that person involved, right? Like that's a huge topic in and of itself, but so often it's about the goal of converting someone, but you need to see it through. Kind of actually, we did refer to it a little bit for the when you were saying that a lot of people, you know, what causes people to doubt and, and, and go back from Islam. You and Nurhan brought up, brought up those points. So being conscious of that and really thinking that okay if i'm going to bring somebody into this theme then i'm going to be with them for the long run right i'm 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 going to try and make sure that they stay connected to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's obviously where the reward is and and it's a huge reward it's an amazing thing to witness and it's an amazing feeling to have and it's amazing to know that you know that reward is inshallah going to be going back to you as the person who guided them to that so definitely something worth inshallah involving ourselves with inshallah I think like this, I hear people mentioning this a lot, but just to reiterate, I think like, and also like Fadila kind of mentioned it, that that was starts at home. I think like in our daily interactions with the people around us, either at work or school, I think um, like we often underestimate, uh, you know, just us, the way we, you know, our character, the way we interact with others, um, even the way like we you know practice our religion how you know unapologetic we are about it i think that affects um people's perceptions of islam a lot more than um maybe the intellectual arguments they might hear online so i think that we should you know be cognizant of that yeah i i would i just want to end with like emphasizing what Nurhan just said like we don't realize how much whether we like it or not we are all representatives of Islam in our daily lives including to other Muslims and that it, it'll paint somebody's perception of Islam and it, it might ingrain certain like subconscious notions they have about the deen that will take them a long time to like possibly unlearn if they need to and that is you know it should make us feel the burden of responsibility but also the potential and the opportunity that exists for us you know in everything like in our interactions at the grocery store at the workplace in school like with our neighbors neighbors is a huge one actually that is like a whole topic in and of itself of like you know people like yeah they, they'll realize like you know small things just like you know offering to like help people take out their trash or you know checking in like oh you guys are traveling i'll check in on your house like i'll keep an eye on things like that it affects like those are the people who see you every day when you're leaving your house when you're coming back home and that it, like it can be like very small moments that leave a very strong lasting impression um and that's again like there's a huge potential there for any and every muslim to 
to to engage in dawah just by like being a decent human being by being kind to people and by being confident that's so important to like you know to care to realize that islam is a reason to hold your head high not in arrogance but in confidence that you're on the right path alhamdulillah and that should be like our that should be our constant like just like mode of engagement that even like as much as internally we might feel insecure we might feel like rightfully like a level of shame for not doing you know for not fulfilling our obligations towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the day Islam in itself is what like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who grants people glory and just by uh, calling ourselves Muslims by saying that we submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we have a share in that and that we, we should recognize that and that should help us you know hold our heads high and that will impact how people see Islam and yeah I think that I also I, I wish we had you know I think maybe this would actually be like a important topic to like bring somebody on who's like more specialized to talk about like how to you know um, engage with and like keep new muslims or like newly practicing muslims close in the community and to help them because that's a huge issue where like i i don't know if what these studies are based on but like people always talk about the statistic that like the number of people entering islam in the u.s is like close to the number of people leaving it so that's a huge you know and that's again like an important topic that inshallah we can address at a different point but we'll go ahead and wrap up here. Jazakumullah khairan to everybody who listened. And also thank you to Norhan and Fadila for joining us today. Alhamdulillah, it was awesome to have you guys in the discussion for the first time. Um, and inshallah, we'll have you guys on for future discussions as well. We ask everybody who's listening to keep us in your dua. If you have any recommendations for us uh, or any suggestions on like what we should cover, what we should read. If you have um, any comments, do find us on social media. Sign up for the newsletter to... Um, see what other content we share both from TQP but also from other you know like Muslim happenings around the web and with that we'll go ahead and wrap up Jazakumullah khairan for listening Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh